Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to, to welcome here Mr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former sec uh, National Security Advisor uh, to the President of the United States, uh, Jimmy Carter. He has just had an excellent uh, speech on the future of Central Europe, on the future of Europe. But without any further ado, I will just pass, pass the floor to Mr. Brzezinski to say a few remarks at the beginning. And then maybe we can uh, we can uh, uh, give the floor to the questions. Well, I have a <laughs> I have a question in return. Did they or did they not hear the speech? I hope they did. Well, then what's the point of my talking? <laughs> okay, so we can turn turn it on the on the questions. Please, the first question. Okay. Uh, hi, Mr. Brzezinski. My name is Natalia Radzina. I am the chairman ed editor of Chatter 97. It's the most popular Belarusian independent website. And I am a former political prisoner. My question is so. In one of the latest uh, interviews, you said that the uh, European Union needs in strategy on Belarus and Ukraine. What kind of strategy must be on Belarus? Because Lukashenko, the US president, 20 years old. And for my mind, now European politics is very weak. Is, is what? European politics is very weak, and the European Union trying again and again to have a dialogue with the last dictatorship of Europe. I don't object to a dialogue, but the purpose of the dialogue, I think, has to be strategic. That is to say, it has to be designed to make it clear that the interests of the Belarusian people and of the Ukrainian people will best be served by those countries meeting the standards of Europe and becoming part of Europe. And that in turn will facilitate and accelerate a similar process in Russia. And Russia in Europe would be an important European country and probably a more important and potentially more wealthy and stable country than if it is in a setting in which its former Asian republics are resentful of Russian attempts to limit their genuine independence and in which the future of the far eastern parts of Russia will become uncertain because Russia, not in part of Europe, is going to have increasing vulnerabilities. So I think the West is in a good position to argue constructively and positively that it is in the interest of the Ukrainian, the Belarusian, and eventually the Russian peoples for these countries to meet the fundamental standards of Europe. And they are European countries culturally, and therefore become part of a larger enterprise which would be in their interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, here. Thank you very much. Mr. Jarzinski, my name is Gabor Tot. I come from Budapest. I'm working for the Hungarian news television channel. Let me ask you about, uh, what do you think about the ratio between things or developments in international politics which are happening uh, on purpose and which are happening accidentally? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Is so this my question is with gambling? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so is international politics uh, like a game where the steps are made on calculations and everything happens on purpose? Or um, is that like something where developments uh, are happening uh, accidentally? What is the ratio? You know, think of your own life. <laughs> what percentage of your own life is the product of rational choices on your own part, and to what an extent it is the byproduct of circumstances over which you have no control, which may be good or bad for you? Once you have defined the answer to that question, and you give me those proportions, I'll try to apply the same process to international affairs. But at this moment, I'm not in a position to make that calculation. <laughs> Thank you very much. There was a next question, please. Thank you. 
um, Juana Popescu, Foreign Policy Magazine, Romania. Sir, um, I think a lot of people would actually agree with the vision that you have outlined on in the long run. Uh, but you have also uh, started by saying that the status quo is that, you know, like with climate change and everything, we do suffer from short-termism and Europe does suffer from lack of leaders. So you're a policy advisor. How would you propose to implement what you described? Because, uh, you know, or to be more specific, what would be the incentives for leaders whose immediate interest is to win in the next elections to actually think beyond that in a context of growing nationalisms, economic crisis and so on? Thank you very much. Well, that's a fair question and I think that's the dilemma of democracy. Uh, in democracy, there is a lot of pressure for opportunistic politicians to emerge because democracy means cultivating the voters in order to be in power. But also, democracies are not immune, first of all, to the appearance of people who rise historically. They're unique. This is what makes them special. I mentioned three names by way of example in regards to Europe. And one hopes that in the younger generation of leaders, including from Central Europe, there are individuals who are beginning to realize that there are some serious problems that the West confronts. And if they're not addressed, the West will deteriorate. I think that is the choice. And perhaps once we become more aware of that choice, people will be prepared more to vote, not in terms of what happens in the next two years, but more in terms of what they want to avoid over the next 20 years. <laughs> because after all, all of us have children. We are thinking of their future their grandchildren, and we have to confront that reality and understand it. It's always easier to understand the immediate reality than the longer one. But it is not impossible for some leaders to sense, to anticipate, to understand what the longer range realities portend in a negative sense, and to start warning about it, and to start advocating remedies. That's what defines a successful democratic leader. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Um, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Gabor Zord uh, from Modern Nemz Daily Newspaper Hungary. My question is that do you think you can already consider uh, the policy of the United States in the Middle East, uh, what we have seen in the past uh, 20 years, let's say, uh, from the beginning of the Gulf War, uh, as a dead end already? Well, I'm not sure it's a dead end, but it certainly is not being productive. Yeah, I am a critic in the United States you know, of a policy in which the United States proclaims certain objectives for the Middle East, such as, for example, a fair, enduring peace of accommodation between Israel and the Palestinians. And then having proclaimed that as its objective, it doesn't pursue it with the influence that it has influence with both parties, the Arabs, the Palestinians, and Israel. Now, whether that will change or not is something I cannot predict. I have become somewhat more pessimistic than I was when I was actively engaged in it, in the government. And we had Camp David I, which resulted in Egyptian-Israeli peace. I was somewhat more optimistic during the first Obama the presidency because he articulated very compellingly a vision of the future which I share and which I think is desirable but he didn't then strategically implement it he now has a second chance but uh, I would not you know put my head on the line for the, on behalf of the proposition that he will necessarily act I hope he will but as I said I'm now a skeptic before I was a supporter. <laughs> Thank you. The next, next question is there. Darius uh, Haraksin, TV Yoy, Slovakia. Uh, what do you think about the Boston um, tragedy happening just uh, two days ago? And, um, it's actual. What do you think about it? There were some rumors about a uh, terrorist attack. And uh, the second question is, do you feel safe just uh, two days after the attack in Boston? Well, I'm right now in Bratislava. 
No, Carlo, let, let's be serious. I mean, what do I think about it? You know, I, I don't approve of it, you know. Look, we live in an era in which terrorism can happen anywhere. And uh, we live in an era in which increasingly destructive means are accessible to individuals or small groups. And we live in an era in which there are more and more politically activist people, politically awakened people, who harbor serious grievances. We also live in an era in which the use of drugs is more widespread and can precipitate actions by individuals. So we live in an era in which this kind of tragedy, outrageous morally, cruel in a human sense, has become part of the reality of our times. But, you know, so I have said it, but my saying it doesn't solve the problem, doesn't identify who it was. I personally hope it was one individual. I hope it was someone who is mentally ill rather than some sort of conspiracy, because conspiracies then lead to demagogy against the conspiracies. And demagogies against conspiracies can then increase the number of conspirators. It's sort of a vicious circle. But you also have to remember that terrorism, which started late in the 19th century with Bakunin and so forth, went through a phase, became very widespread, then it subsided. Then it rose again. When I was in the White House in the late 70s, there were 2,000 terrorist acts in one year in Italy alone. <laughs> and yet today, Italy is a relatively stable, peaceful country which enjoys the Dolce Vita and <laughs> more than serious politics. But that's preferable to terrorism. Thank you very much. The next question was here. Maja Poznatov, Beta News Agency, Serbia. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, the United States are losing interest in the Balkans? And should the EU uh, integrate faster uh, the Western Balkans countries? I don't think the United States is losing interest, but I think we realize that, after all, it's the European Community, the European Union, which will either be expanding to include more rapidly the Balkan countries, or more slowly, and that is a legitimate European decision to make, not ours. Because the consequences, one way or the other, beneficial or negative, are the consequences with which the Europeans will be living, not us. We don't expect the Europeans to tell us whether we should have more effective gun laws or not, because the decision will affect us, not the Europeans. And I don't think the Europeans should expect us to be taking positions on how rapidly the Balkans should be integrated into Europe. It's a European decision. Thank you very much. Is there a last burning question? If not, then I thank you for, for your attendance and uh, see you tomorrow.